Hi guys. Well, I appreciate you hanging with me here as we barrel into chapter 23 of Peruvian Plunge. And I, just a quick warning, this is an X, the only X rating you're going to get. If you want to skip this chapter, it makes no difference to the narrative of the story, but we're going to title this chapter St. Peter's Witty. And we're going to kick off with a quote from archaeologist Ronald Wright from Cut Stones and Crossroads, A Journey in Peru. <clears throat> San Pedro Cactus Shaman Eduardo Systems of Belief stresses the difference between looking, everyday perception, and seeing, the ability to perceive the inner nature of things with the aid of the cactus. It took Don Juan years to teach Carlos Castaneda to see, but I think I can see in Eduardo and the shamans like him, whom Peruvian native Carlos Castaneda must have known, the inner nature of the world's most famous Yaqui sorcerer, mentor of the world's richest anthropologist, suggesting that uh, Castaneda based Don Juan on a San Pedro worker. So anyway, we are now at Tuesday, July 7th, 2009 at the Manu Learning Center. One more time, TMI alert. If you really don't care to hear about yours truly's autoerotic response to seeing with the aid of San Pedro Cactus <clears throat> that it's been way too long since he's gotten laid, then I highly suggest you skip this chapter. I'm simply doing my part for anthropological and ethnobotanical research and passing along what I learned from the San Pedro gods. Okay, you've been warned. <clears throat> By Monday morning, business as usual had returned to Manu Learning Center. <clears throat> the dining room and lounge were overflowing with green empowerment students and teachers, and the gazebo was overflowing with tents, so I took my ballpoint pen and spiral-bound notebook to the tranquil respite of the orchid garden, where the constant white noise of the waterfall drowned out all but the shrillest yelps from the 40 or so folks above me. Setting up an elaborate system of rain deflection utilizing my umbrella, the shade cloth, and some carefully positioned banana leaves, I was able to stay remarkably dry. For eight hours per day, I entered the parallel universe of the spiritual travelogue writer as my chicken scratches formed into the last chapters of Peruvian plunge. It was a pattern I would hold religiously for eight days. <clears throat> Besides catching up on my writing, there was one other item remaining on my to-do list while at Manu Learning Center. To celebrate the July full moon scheduled to rise on Tuesday night, <clears throat> I'm finally getting around to typing this on the August full moon, I had been a good little spiritual pilgrim and law-abiding resident of Manu Learning Center and had not let one drop of alcohol or hit of weed pass my lips for four days. My last bite of food had been swallowed on Monday night. As the hours ticked away and the growls of protest from my stomach intensified, I realized I still had a critical decision to make before my self-appointed deadline of 4.20 p.m. Whether to welcome Sister Moon with the aid of Ayahuasca or San Pedro. As you may recall, I had picked up heaping helpings of each at the public market in Cusco. Of course, what I had not picked up, not counting the $5 CD of Ayahuasca Icaros, was a shaman to lead me on the journey. <clears throat> Against all advice from everyone, except Spirit, who for some strange reason seemed to be sitting this decision out on the sidelines, 
this would be a journey I would be taking alone with nobody along for the ride except myself, Mother Earth, Sister Moon, and whoever else showed up. The first time I had done ayahuasca, visitors included a couple of turquoise anacondas and a choir of gospel-singing chartreuse crocodiles. The first time I had done San Pedro, I was visited by Quetzalcoatl, the Hopi Red Star Kachina, and don't forget Jesus. <clears throat> Just that much more confirmation of the truth about the looming apocalypse. In the end, my decision to go with San Pedro is more pragmatic than spiritually dogmatic. I intuited that San Pedro would be less risky and that I would be more likely to pull off being able to trip on San Pedro, essentially peyote with Brother Mescalito acting as ringmaster in the middle of 40 people than I would be tripping on ayahuasca. <clears throat> I took great pleasure in the knowledge that neither plant spirit guide would officially qualify as violations of Manu Learning Center's illegal drug policy, but I also knew that either one would violate the Kriya's Foundation's gross misconduct policy, and I would be kicked out on my ass if any inappropriate behavior was elicited by either mind-expanding choice. <clears throat> with the possible exception of a little puking and the outside chance of being bitten by a snake or falling off a cliff or getting lost in the jungle or drowning in the Mother of God River, what could be the worst gross misconduct I could be accused of with something so benign as a little mescaline swirling around in my brain for a few hours? See, famous last words by the late Hambone Littletail. Comforted by such Virgo stoner arrogant rationalizations, I finished my little six dollar I fished my little six dollar baggie of powdered cactus from the bottom of my bag of cannonballs, filled a little plastic bottle with water to mix it with, and headed down the steep slippery stairs to the east facing bank of the Mother of God, which should have provided a gorgeous view of the full moonrise in the driest month of the year, had we not been trapped under a fucking soggy gray blanket of drizzle for three straight nights in a row. Screw it, I, screw it, I said to myself, I'll celebrate the energy of the full moon, if not the visual delight. I walked down the rocky beach for 50 yards or so, feeling around for my power spot, when spirit placed directly in my path a group of objects so bizarre that I had never even, even considered the idea of them, and even now, three weeks later, I'm wondering how to describe what I was looking at. Work with me here, guys. In the middle of the rocky beach along the Madre de Dios River, in the middle of nowhere Peru, some unseen hand, assumedly human, but I wouldn't bet my house on it, had balanced a football-sized, perhaps 10-pound rock on its pointed end. And not just once, but three times. Are you following me here? These three rocks were, by all appearances, sticking straight up out of the other rocks. They weren't half buried in the sand, propped up against other rocks, or super glued. I'm telling you, it would have been much easier to balance a football or a watermelon on its end than these rocks. I knew that Peruvians are masters at stacking shit, just look at all their ruins, but this had entered the realm of the physically impossible. Had I already eaten the San Pedro and forgotten? I reached out and barely touched 
one of the rocks with my fingertip. It crashed to the ground, rejoining the 10 million other rocks hopelessly bound to the law of physics from which it had miraculously risen. But clearly, I had found my power spot. Though it was a wee bit too exposed and rocky for my taste, leaving the other two <clears throat> Leaving the other two ancient mystery totems defying gravity and guarding the beach, I retreated 30 or so feet to the edge of the forest and took a seat on a driftwood log beside the little side stream 50 feet downstream from the orchid-guarded waterfall. My trusty little radio shack alarm clock said 4.18 p.m., two minutes to go before the big gulp and then, as this happened too many times in the past, moments before I took the hallucinogenic plunge, two people appeared out of nowhere. God damn it! My uninvited and unwelcome guests were two of the young male volunteers, one from Ireland, the other from Germany. They stopped dead in their tracks when they spotted me from 20 yards out. They seemed about as thrilled to see me as I was to see them. They held a private animated consultation. The Irishman stalked off down the beach, leaving his German friend to deal with the weird meddlesome old fart from Texas. He casually walked up to me and with barely a mumble of greeting, proceeded to probe around in the sand barely two feet from where I sat on the log. The object of this excavation was a two-inch long soapstone puma pipe, identical to the very one I had bought in Pisac. <clears throat> we can't have this evil little guy messing up the beautiful vibe at Manu Learning Center, now can we, he joked, stoner to stoner, and that secret language we all share. He pocketed the pipe in his shirt and ambled off to join his stoner buddy down the beach for the 420 pause that refreshes. Alone again, it was now or never. <clears throat> My uninvited and unwelcome guest, <clears throat> oops, by far, this computer is jumping all around, guys, and I don't know why the down arrow isn't working. All right. Alone again, it was now or never. <clears throat> By far the toughest challenge of inviting the San Pedro God into your brain, tougher even than the challenge with ayahuasca or mushrooms, is getting the foul-tasting shit past your tongue and down your throat without gagging and puking. How did the first Peruvian shamans ever figure out that such a disgusting brew could take them on journeys to other dimensions of reality if they puked every, every time they tried to ingest it? My plastic bottle contained 12 ounces of water. There was no way I would be able to get that much of the slimy brew down. I don't care how watered down it was. My logic was that it would be easier to quaff down four ounces of concentrated brew in a couple of, a couple of gulps and take my gag reflex by surprise. <clears throat> Following this optimistic train of thought, I guzzled down eight ounces of water to cleanse my palate. I opened up the little baggie of phlegm green powder poured it through the narrow neck of the bottle and shook up my magic elixir. When I did this, the thirsty powdered cactus sucked up every drop of the water, leaving a foul-smelling antifreeze green layer of sludge with the consistency and fluidity of overcooked oatmeal lying in the bottom of the bottle. Well, this is fucking great, I curse, turning the bottle completely upside down. The toxic sludge clung to the ceiling like a four-ounce booger of snot. 
At this point, I had no choice except to fill the bottle back up with muddy creek water, trusting that the San Pedro would kill the Giardia, cholera, and dysentery producing amoebas that I was no doubt getting ready to ingest. <clears throat> this infusion of muddy creek water transformed the brew into a bottle of scummy green pond water that looked every bit as unappetizing even to a starving person who had not eaten all day as it smelled. Is this reality really all that bad that you have to put yourself through all this shit? I asked myself as I uncut capped the bottle and steeled my nerves for the, for the plunge into the fourth dimension like I was looking over the edge of a 50-foot waterfall with an icy pool of rock-filled water below. With one last toast to spirit, I tipped the bottle back and gulped down my first mouthful of the bitter, slimy brew. Halfway between my throat and my stomach, it did an about-face in my esophagus. Somehow, I managed to staunch the rising tide of vomit and force the nasty slop back down into my empty stomach. With nothing to cleanse my palate now between swigs, I repeated this foul-tasting ritual eight or nine times over the next quarter hour, half expecting to hurl all my hard work after each swallow. With a pool of puke churning in my guts, I abandoned the effort with two or three ounces of sludge remaining in the bottle. One more swallow of that vile shit, and I would be spraying it across the beach. <clears throat> For the third time in my life, I sat back and waited for Brother Mescalito to come calling. The first time I had tried San Pedro, I had waited for 90 minutes feeling nothing. It was only after I added three hits of weed to the brew that Tinkerbell appeared, heralding three hours of mind-blowing and apocalypse-confirming visions. Even with weed, I had felt nothing. I mean, zip, nada, the second time I had tried it, though this was at least partly due to my decision to eat it with a lame-brained motormouth chatterbox sitting next to me. Sitting there on that log on the banks of the Mother of God in the dying light of a gray grizzly day, <clears throat> I had neither weed nor motormouth chatterbox to help or hinder me on my journey. It was all up to the San Pedro gods from this point forward. During that magical 10-minute crack between the worlds, when all color fades from the landscape, yet silhouettes of trees and mountains remain fixed against the darkening background canvas of sky, Brother Mescalito whispered to me to blink my eyes as rapidly as possible, creating a kind of open-eyed REM sleep. When I followed his instructions, it was as if the entire world was lit up by a brilliant flickering silver strobe light. The silhouettes of trees and rocks cavorted and gyrated all around me and sent my brain spiraling off into some parallel universe suspended there in the strengthening drizzle between myself and the Mother of God. Inhabiting this softly lit realm were not fantastic visions of Tinkerbell and plumed serpent Mayan gods warning of the coming end times, but the crystal clear <clears throat> Kodachrome visages of some of my very real friends in South Austin, Texas, gazing into the faces of people I love and may not see again for who knows how long I was moved almost to the verge of tears, not so much by homesickness as by the dawning realization that there is nothing I will ever be able to do or say to these folks, some of whom may be reading these words right now to make them get it. 
The handbook for the new paradigm warns again and again that this feeling of quiet desperation that you are leaving behind loved ones to follow their own paths at their own pace while you race ahead on your own path toward a brave new world is one of the most daunting and sure as hell the loneliest obstacles you will encounter as we move toward this new paradigm, whatever the hell that is. Since I cannot knock my friends upside the head with a 2x4, all I can do is love them unconditionally and hope that some of what I feel rubs off on them between the lines of this unfolding saga. I was yanked back from the parallel universe of South Austin by the steadily strengthening rain. I fumbled around for my umbrella and flung it open to fend off the rain gods that had been dogging me for three straight days. Heading back across the rain-swept darkened beach with Brother Mescalito dancing in my head, I felt more like I was on some wind-swept moor in Scotland than in the Amazon rainforest. <clears throat> the rising full moon looked like the dim smudge of a dirty cotton ball behind the scuttling rain clouds. As I clambered over the wet rocks, it suddenly occurred to me that I still had not figured out where I will spend December 21st, 2012. Perhaps in the Inca ruins in the heart of Amaracari to celebrate the ass whipping of Hun Oil. Who knows? I also feel that something else happened on that walk along the Mother of God in the rain and murky moonlight that night, but whatever information download from the universal computer I received obviously took place on a level that my puny little conscious brain cannot access. As, as is the case with dreams, so much of hallucinogenic experience, no doubt the most important parts can never be recalled later. Groping my way through the darkness of the forest fringe, I negotiated my way up the lowest set of stairs. I took refuge on the first landing under a leafy tree, which, aided by my umbrella, offered me admirable protection from the rain. I scrunched up against a tree trunk and gazed through San Pedro glazed eyes over the dark and rolling Madre de Dios, softly backlit by the faint smudge of moonlight. The rhythmic chant of a tree frog croaking out, 50, 50, 50, as if to remind me of my upcoming half-century birthday, soon carried, carried me off to yet another parallel universe. This one, too, was inhabited by visions of people I love, but this time the visages were of friends who had been damaged emotionally by the sick and twisted misuse of misdirected male sexual energy. And I don't mean just those victims on the receiving end of sexual violence. I also mean those men I know and somehow still love who have inflicted such pain on others and on themselves in the process because they do not have the fucking self-control to keep their damn peckers in their pants. Christ, the sheer mountain of misery that has been inflicted on the human race, not to mention the plain useless wasted energy because folks, male and female, cannot control their damn baboon urges. I've been as guilty of this energy wasting as anyone, though at least I am 100% sure that the women I have wasted it with were over 18, and I'm 99% sure, okay, 98% sure, that the women I have wasted it with all at least 
consented to waste theirs with me. And we're going to come into uh, the TMI alert. And I'm going to break this story right here. So uh, if you do not really care to hear about St. Peter's witty, uh, you can skip over uh, this, the next half chapter and rejoin us in chapter 24. So I'm going to come back and tell you about the rest of my San Pedro trip coming right up.